Hello, listeners. Welcome to a very special summer vacation episode of Point Blank. Justin and I took a trip to San Francisco, where we got a chance to walk in the footsteps of Sam Spade and Dashiell Hammett. Justin put together this very special episode, which is our comments as we walk down the streets and look at some of the sights from both the novels and Hammett's real life. If you're a first-time listener to the show, this isn't our normal format. This is something a little special. If you're a long-time listener, then this is an experiment that we tried. And because it was an experiment, uh, we had new mics, we were out in the wild, the mean streets of San Francisco, as it were, and very windy streets of San Francisco. So there are some audio problems in this one, Uh, but Justin fought hard, and I think he put together something that is worth a listen. We also took photos during our trip, and those are available on Facebook. Uh, You can find us at Point Blank, Hard Boiled Noir and Detective Fiction. We'll eventually uh, get these also up on our website at pointblankpodcast.com, and we'll have a little timestamp and a little description of each of the sites uh, as it uh, corresponds to the audio tour. I hope you enjoy this, and uh, we had some fun making it, even if our mics didn't uh, always do what we wanted them to do. Thanks again for listening, and I hope you enjoy. Point Blank is a crime fiction podcast. It may not be suitable for all listeners. We discuss violence in all its forms. The works we reference may include period slang, which some listeners may find offensive. The hosts also have a tendency to swear. Episode Bonus Dashiell Hammett's San Francisco. Welcome, everybody, to this bonus edition of Point Blank. This is Justin, your host for today, and this is a bonus episode. This does not fit within one of our longer author-centric episodes that we've been showcasing since the podcast began. This is a episode about a trip that Kurt and I recently took to fog-drenched San Francisco, California. This was in late July, and part of our inspiration for the trip, of course, was the fact that Dashiell Hammett spent eight years in San Francisco. It's where he honed his chops as a writer. It's where he developed most of the characters that we have come to know and love, including Sam Spade in The Maltese Falcon, which we discussed extensively in episode 12, and also the Continental Op which we discussed in episode two in Red Harvest. Kurt and I spent a couple days in San Francisco just soaking it all in. And originally we had planned all this Dashiell Hammett and hard-boiled detective style activities, or at least we entertained the idea of doing a few things that were uh, a little more organized. But as as luck will have it, or as the story goes, you can't have uh, a story without problems, without conflict. One of the things we wanted to do was go to Alcatraz, the infamous prison now closed down, now run by the National Park Service, actually. But apparently you can't get a ferry to Alcatraz unless you plan two months in advance, at least, because we were left out in the cold and neither of us are strong enough swimmers to entertain the idea of swimming across, though perhaps drunkenly we might have uh, debated the merits of such an act. Another thing we really wanted to do was take the well-known and long-established Dashiell Hammett Tour, which is run by Don Heron, H-E-R-R-O-N. He is a lover of hard-boiled fiction and also a writer himself, but he is best known in San Francisco for the tour that he has led for the past 30-plus years through the streets of San Francisco, taking tourists or fans of Dashiell Hammett or his books all up and down the streets uh, of Knob Hill and Russian Hill and into the Tenderloin District and the Financial District downtown in showing us sites from Dashiell's greatest books, including Sam Spade's office, including the place where Archer was shot, the alley where he was shot by Brigham O'Shaughnessy, including some places where the Continental Op operated. Now, As I said before, things don't go according to plan, and unfortunately for both us and for Don himself, he had to uh, have a surgery this summer, and the surgery put him out of commission for pretty much the entire summer, I guess, because he wasn't 
able to lead any tours during the time that we were in town. So what we did instead is we picked up his book. He put out a book. The most recent edition was put out by Vince Emery Productions, and it's the third edition, came out in 2009. And this is called the Don Heron Dashiell Hammett Tour 30th Anniversary Guidebook. If you want to know more about Dashiell Hammett's San Francisco, this is a great reference book. It's a good read. He includes quite a few pictures, both historic and self-taken maps, uh, walking maps and driving maps all over the city. And we use this book extensively while we toured the streets of San Francisco. And we're going to share our findings and our reactions to being live on the streets, walking the beat in San Francisco, trying to trace the ghosts of Dashiell Hammett and Sam Spade and the Continental Op, etc., through these fog-shrouded neighborhoods in a place that is mesmerizing. I love San Francisco, and it's it's a shame that regular people, working-class people, even middle-class people are not able to live there anymore because of exorbitant prices, uncontrolled rent, the cost of living there. You have to be essentially a millionaire in order to afford it. And it's really sad because I'd love to uh, move to North Beach someday and spend a few years uh, maybe after uh, some kind of economic crash. So without further ado, I bring to you me and Kurt's ramblings from the streets of San Francisco. Enjoy. Justin and I are here in San Francisco at 620 Eddy Street, and we are looking at one of Hammett's residences uh, in the city. It was here, you know, he lived here for five years in this building, and this is where a lot of the writing for the Black Mass magazine happened. Um, I don't know, it's interesting that the architecture is still intact. I mean, you can see some nice elaborate, um, what do you call that stuff? Sconces? 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 Yes, yeah, decorative work on the outside fire escapes yep. they have an art deco quality to them the building actually looks i would say even somewhat slightly newer than that time frame that I, you know at least in my head how i would look at it so maybe it's been redone a bit it's certainly been painted and uh, i mean it has a, a certain charm to it and we're definitely in the tenderloin uh, district in san francisco and things haven't changed much probably since the time that hammett was around well, or, well there's probably more heroin on the street as we've yeah, already least, seen you know it's a frisky area oh the door is opening Justin, is that Dash? No, it's not. No, no, that's not. No. Well. Unfortunately. On to the uh, on to the next site, I guess. Indeed. All right, so we are on Olive Street now in the Tenderloin District, and before me is a building in the middle of Olive Street, which is essentially an alley. There's a lot of construction work today. Uh, it's a cloudy day, and uh, there's a lot of activity, but there's not much happening with this building. This site, the reason it's on this tour, is because it was once uh, known as, or the inspiration for the restaurant Blanco's, which is featured in The Dane Curse, which is the last of Hammett's continental op novels. I'm currently reading The Dane Curse, and I'm really digging into it. The thing about Blanco's now is that it's been recently, it seems, painted over and the sign that says Blanco's is no longer visible. All we have is a painted brick building. It's an attractive building, but uh, there's no evidence that it was once a restaurant or uh, the idea of a restaurant. So we move on. All right, so we're now at 811 Geary Street in the Uptown Tenderloin Historic District. And we are at the site of, where are we at, Kurt? Oh, well, we are at, this is, I guess this hotel um, used to be a residence hotel. So uh, fantasy uh, writer Fritz uh, Leiber lived here in the 70s. He lived here for, I believe, seven years. And he, what's um, important about that is that he did some of the initial research um, as part of like newspaper uh, series and stuff like that, researching some of the locations of Hammett works within the city and um, he was able to do that while a lot of the buildings were still standing and you know since that time some of the stuff has been ripped down but he was able to identify a lot of that stuff and uh, just interesting um, you know that this is obviously a writer's town we have Hammett and uh, and Liber and Kerouac and uh, numerous numerous other San Francisco writers. Yeah, and that's just speaking of, of the classic authors, and 
This is now, I guess, known as the Hotel Union, or at least at one point it was. It's also uh, formerly known as the Rodema and the San Carlo. So it has a long history as being a residential space in this uh, ever-evolving city. All right, so we are currently standing at 891 Post. This is the site of Sam Spade's apartment. This is a classic, a critical piece in the puzzle of Hammett's San Francisco. Well, uh, looking at this building now, you know, they, they went through a lot of research as to where Hammett's apartment would actually be. Um, it is, if you're standing on the corner of uh, Hyde and Post, um, and you're looking up from the uh, since San Francisco Coin Laundry Company. It's a, it's the top apartment, and we're pretty sure that this is the apartment because uh, the current owner actually has it redecorated to what it is described as in the books, and just the details from the book, um, except for one small item, they all make sense to what happens in the book, and obviously we can't get in it today. But but we're going to go take a look at a plaque in here in just a second. This, this is the spot. This is supposedly where Spade, uh, Spade lived and um, has the famous scene towards the end of the Maltese Falcon. And I guess we'll go take a look at the plaque. In our quest to uh, find the home of, of Sam Spade, Justin and I have just committed a crime by uh, jaywalking across the street. But here we are now looking at the plaque, and yes, it is to find the, the home of Dashiell Hammett and Sam Spade. Hammett lived in the building according to the block for three years, 26 to 29, and here he wrote Red Harvest, The Dane Curse, and The Maltese Falcon. So we've seen the apartment where Hammett spent his early days crafting his uh, writing that went to Black Mask, and now we've seen the place where Hammett has developed his early and arguably best novels. Yes, we could call this the novel apartment, could we not? You, you might. You might call him that. Thanks, friends of Libraries USA, for establishing this nice little literary landmark. Unfortunately, we cannot. We don't have the buzzer number of uh, of, of Dash Hammett here, so otherwise we could have us have him ring us in. We could just obnoxiously press numbers and see what happens, but we're not going to do that today. Of course, as soon as I said that, I couldn't help myself. Uh, we're going to type in Spade. We're going to see if we can find Spade here. That would be a nice little moment if they entered his name. A tribute. Sam Spade. Nope. And there is no Dashiell Hammett either. Oh well. Well, let's move on. From there, we moved on to 1155 Leavenworth. This was the last in a series of apartments where Dash Hammett lived in San Francisco. These were the San Loreto apartments. And it was here that actually he moved his family and they had been sort of in and out of the town for a while. This was just after just after the stock market crash of 1929. And uh, I had spoken a little bit about this apartment, but uh, my mic did not record, so I missed that. So we bring you into Kurt uh, midstream talking about these apartments before we move on. We were uh, at this point in the midst of Knob Hill, chugging up the hill and then back down again getting our exercise before uh, some good old-fashioned Anchor Steam beer. Yes, the beautiful sounds of a cement mixer in the background. Hammond is so associated with San Francisco, and one or some people have sort of said that, well, you know, Hammond was in love with this city, but his actions don't really speak that. I think he lived here out of convenience, because once he left the town, he never really came back. So this was it really his last residence uh, in the Bay Area. He didn't really have a fondness for it necessarily after he left. It was Hollywood and New York and on to, in his eyes, bigger and better things. However, you know, maybe if he had stayed here, he would have actually uh, got some more writing done. And hopefully now the rest of our tour will be back uh, going down the hill. Yeah, we just uh, walked up Knob Hill, essentially, to the top, and now we're working our way down. It's not a terribly warm day. Uh, I guess you'd call it a typical San Francisco style day. Overcast, a little breezy, uh, and temperate. But, uh, but then why am I sweating? Because <laughs> you're wearing five layers of clothing, Justin. If, it, if it's below 65, I guess you <laughs> All right, offwards, down the hill. So uh, now we're standing in front of 1201 California, and um, this is 
one of the more contested spots in the of actual locations. This is the possible hotel of Brigitte O'Shaughnessy in the Maltese Falcon. There's been a lot of work trying to figure this one out. And uh, Don, in his book, basically says this is a complete guess. Um, but hey, you know what? It's got some neat uh, architecture on the outside, a big uh, arc with uh, looks like angels and uh, soldiers and all sorts of things on it. So sure, why not? Really a lovely building. If you think about it, uh, you know, think of it in the 1920s, it's pretty high. It would have been one of the larger buildings in the city and it has a bit of a deco influence. Uh, it's quite an attractive place and I imagine uh, there are only a, a good handful of buildings that could have been hers that matched up with the uh, um, particulars of, of the story. So, you know, the percentage is not too low that it's wrong. So let's call it. Uh, Brigitte couldn't argue. On to the next thing. As we uh, continue to walk along here, I've been following behind Justin, and uh, he decided that he was going to follow someone in true Continental Op fashion. However, he kind of failed in his mission uh, because uh, he wasn't following uh, Dash Hammett's uh, rules of surveillance, and that was he was acting a bit suspicious, and Dash tells us from his days, as a Pinkerton, you shouldn't do that. Um, I think Dash also says that uh, you shouldn't look him in the eye, and I think when Justin tracked him down, he stared him uh, right down into the eyes, so I think he knew he was getting followed. On with the tour. We're heading toward the grand finale of our tour of Dash O'Hammett's San Francisco. We're walking on California on a windswept day over Knob Hill. Uh, this is a street uh, known for uh, uh, the east-west cable car operation in town, and there's a cable car right now stopped in the middle of the street picking up passengers. We're working our way down a Dash O'Hammett Way, which is a street named for the famed author. According to Don Heron's guidebook, it was Lawrence Ferlinghetti, the poet and co-founder of City Lights Bookstore, who had the idea several years prior to the naming of Dash O'Hammett Way that, um, that Dash O should be on the list with many other great literary luminaries from the Bay Area or who once lived here. Uh, of course, we were hanging out at City Lights two days ago, and it's a wonderful bookstore. Fairling Getty was uh, and still is known uh, for his uh, involvement with the beat movement as a key fixture, anarchist and poet, trailblazer, and a close confidant of Kerouac and Ginsburg, etc. So, uh, and we are here now at Dashiell Hammett Way, which is a short street that connects two major thoroughways in town, Pine and whatever the hell's down on the other side. It's a steep street. It looks like a dangerous street, one where it might might be uh, a place where crime would occur in the 20s. There's nothing really too spectacular about it, but it's a one-way street with some trees. Hey, look at that. All right, we're now at Burritt. Oh. And actually, right behind me Whoa. is... What does it say, Kurt? On the approximately this spot, Miles Archer, partner of Sam Sprade, was done in by Brigid O'Shaughnessy. It's cool. It's a really cool pl plaque because they don't imply in any way that this was fictional. No, it doesn't. And I guess uh, one of the things is that's been interesting about this plaque is it has confused a number of people as to why there's a plaque for a fictional murder. Yeah. Um, with no explanation, and it does. Interestingly, it looks like someone has tried to pry the plaque off a number of times. Yeah, it was not the perfect crime because they failed. Yes, they did, so it is well affixed. There is they, a, a forensic sign on this apartment or on this complex, so if you were looking to uh, live in a famed fictional location and you also had $2,500 to spare for Probably month, more right? than they that. Go to afford San Francisco and uh, some of this legacy. Yeah, so here we are. Um, I don't know. This, I mean, this looks like a good alley if you're going to kill somebody. Yeah, it looks like a good place to die. Especially uh, at night, perhaps on a foggy San Francisco Eve. Um, yeah, and we're going to go take a, a look at uh, where the body was dumped uh, here in a moment. Yeah, Stockton um, Tunnel. Here we come. Yes, there I see a, a, a woman at the end of this alley now who may be trying to lure us to our death. Yeah, well, we, we should go. You know, we should probably go. We'll let you know how this works out, listeners. All right, we are, uh, we, we've survived our ordeal with a femme fatale in the alley, and uh, we are now at the uh, Stockton Tunnel, and this is, of course, at the beginning of the Maltese Falcon. 
where a uh, spade is called to, into uh, identify the body of, of Archer. We are standing on the top of the tunnel right now. We're looking at the, the green door sign, a touch of ecstasy, massage, sauna, whirlpool. Yeah, and just above the green door, we have a, a couple windows, both of which have bottles of alcohol. And the Stockton Street, I guess it's Stockton Road, goes beneath Knob Hill. Above it is another road. It's strange how this works because Stockton's down there, but what is this road then? Is this also Stockton? It's upper and lower? It's fascinating. Probably going to descend these steps here in a moment and go down into the tower. Yeah, we're descending now into the t uh, into under the tunnel here. We're going to take a look at what it looks like compared to a historic photo from 1928. This area is under surveillance, probably no doubt because of the death of Archer. Uh, it's probably been under surveillance and then, I, yes, it has nothing to do with uh, all the other nefarious activities happening in San Francisco these days or in the past. I uh, made it down to the tunnel and the, mo the most dangerous thing that we had along the way was a man with hot coffee. Um, it is actually a much longer tunnel than I anticipated from up top. And um, looking at the site now and looking at the historic photo, um, it, yeah, there's a little bit of change. The, uh, the uh, billboard that um, Hammett references in the novel is, you know, there's a building there now. That's not a, an empty space anymore, of course. Sorry about that. And uh, yes, we're in the way of people, so I'm standing now behind a column. Um, but really, I mean, some of these buildings are the same buildings on this street. Um, you know, I could s certainly see somebody perhaps dumping a body around here uh, even today. Oh, look, what's that? Oh, it's not a body. Yeah, and listeners, we are going to try to get some uh, some photos up on probably our Facebook page um, of some of these sites. So if you want to see them, we'll we'll try to get that up on there and uh, take a look. And we'll we'll uh, we'll try to get that up uh, right about the time this episode releases. So here we are uh, at 111 Sutter. This is the uh, Spade and Archer apartment or uh, office building. It's actually called the Hunter Dunlin Building. That's the official name for it. And it's the same building that was here in the 1920s, and back then it would have been a significant feature on the skyline of the city. It's quite yeah, tall. Yeah, certainly would have been. It's, it's a pretty nice building of that era. And the other, it, it is interesting that there are uh, falcons actually in the uh, decorative work of the building. Yeah, and falcons and some other animals, a bison it looks like. wonder if that bird up there was an influence to his decision to make the the Maltese a falcon. Yeah, who knows? I mean, uh, Hammett, I guess, you know, he did walk a fair bit in the city, so I'm, you know, he probably, I'm sure he knew that those were on there. Uh, one thing that is interesting is I think a lot of people have the perception of the private detective having sort of a rundown office, and Spade certainly did not because, at, because of the fire and everything, there really wasn't rundown office uh, space in this city at that time frame. So, at the time that Hammond puts him in this building, the, I believe the building was only about five years old or something like that. So he would have had pretty uh, brand spanking new offices. And uh, if we can, we're going to try to go inside the lobby of the building because I believe that is open to the public um, and it's supposed to have some very nice architecture inside. We did make it into the lobby and it was a nice place, but we didn't have too much to say on it. So we moved on getting to the last leg of the tour. And uh, at this point, my mic cuts out a bit, so we lose some of my uh, commentary. And so let me present to you Kurt, who regales you on the last few locations before I pop back in toward the end at John's Grill for the final stop. And uh, now we're standing outside the Sir Francis Drake Hotel, which is supposedly the site of where uh, Gutman and uh, his team uh, stayed. Not as uh, impressive of a place as some of the other buildings in the area. This is, of course, that uh, the place where that weird scene where Spade gets drugged by uh, Gutman's daughter occurs. Other than that, it's not really mentioned that much in the book. On to our next spot. Okay, we've walked a little bit further downtown, and we're standing at 870 Market Street. And this is where the Pinkerton offices would have been uh, where, where Hammett would have worked. It is really quite beautiful. 
Yeah, some giant sconces. And uh, just outside of here, too, is also the clock, which was put in by the uh, Samuels Jewelers, where uh, Hammett worked briefly as an advertising uh, man and had that, apparently a good relationship with that guy. That's the uh, he, he loaned him money many times in his career, and uh, it's the only remaining thing of the jewelry store, but it's right out here in front of this flood building. So we're going to go in the lobby here in a moment and just take a look inside. Yeah, we're here in the lobby, and there is a replica of a Maltese Falcon. Of course, it is a fake, of a fake. But we found we found the Falcon, so we're we're done with our investigation. So I'm here at John's Grill. This is the uh, last stop in the tour. This is a classic restaurant. It's been here since 1908, and it's home of the Maltese Falcon that we just spoke of in the flood building next door. This is the original location, and this is a place that Dashiell Hammett ate often when he was living in San Francisco. And it's also a place where he placed Sam Spade in a scene in the Maltese Falcon where Sam Spade sits down to eat some food, specifically a plate of lamb chops, a baked potato, and a sliced tomatoes. And those are still on the menu. Uh, on the menu here in the front of John's Grill, there is a um, item called Sam Spade's Lamb Chops. You can get them for $28.95 and they are served, like I said, with the potato and tomatoes. Back then, of course, you could smoke in here, and Sam Spade was smoking cigarettes waiting for his food to arrive. You can't do that here now, but looks like Chris is going to go inside and see what he can find. We are walking up the stairs in the John's Grill. Stairs are carpeted. We're on a second story now. There is a hardwood floor. We're wrapping around to see a, another Maltese Falcon. This one looks more realistic than the other one, perhaps. It looks wooden. And uh, there is a display case featuring several copies of the Maltese Falcon, a collection of short stories by Dashiell Hammett, and there are a variety of old editions of Black Mass featuring Dashiell Hammett stories and, and such. So this is pretty much the central for the Maltese Falcon. Yeah, a nice little, uh, I guess you would call Alter to uh, Hammett in the Falcon. Yeah, that's really what it and is. It's nice to see a sign here that says "Warning: Protected by Pinkerton." So yeah, uh, I mean, whatever you might feel about the Pinkertons, we can't deny their influence on Dashiell Hammett and uh, private detective fiction. But that is a really nice sign. So I think that's uh, that's kind of the end of our Hammett tour. How do you feel, uh, Kurt, about this experience? Cool. I'm glad we did it. Yeah, I'm glad we did it too. I'm ready to eat. Maybe some sliced tomatoes. Maybe yes. maybe a, a, a couple of bottles of Anchor Steam. Sounds sounds lovely. Well, to wrap up, we did want to thank John's Grill. Uh, we did not buy anything while we were there, but they did let us come in and wander around willy-nilly, uh, despite half looking like hobos. So uh, we appreciated that, and we appreciated Don Heron uh, for putting out this book because the tour without him wasn't going to be the same, but we were able to make the most out of that situation, and we had a great time wandering the streets of San Francisco. It is a lovely city. I can see where Dash gets his inspiration in his early work, and uh, it's a city that I would uh, look forward to returning to uh, sooner rather than later. Hope you enjoyed this bonus episode, and I look forward to uh, episode 14 coming soon. We are going to take a look at Stieg Larsson's The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, our first dip into Nordic Noir. That will be out uh, in early autumn. Take care. Bye. Point Blank is under a Creative Commons license. Music is by Justin. Copywritten works are property of their respective authors. Thank you.